There's an old saying, they don't make them like that anymore. Having probably watched more classic films than any, any other couple in America, in your opinion, what, you know, what could that mean today? I mean, what would filmmakers today, like, you know, learn from directors such as James Whale or Todd Browning? I think the biggest lesson to learn is, uh, is, is to make movies because you want to tell a story and not because you want to make money. Unfortunately, today, outside the old studio system, uh, and, and what studios are left are now run by bankers and money people. They're not artists. And in the classic days, people took much more interest and care in telling a story well. Um, and because they didn't have a lot of money at their disposal, they had to rely on creativity and ingenuity. Um, they, could, they could do things with, with sort of handmade special effects. Um, they could tell stories I, in a way that encouraged audiences to suspend their disbelief. And today, no one really has to suspend their disbelief because CGI makes things so believable that you don't, there's nothing that goes on in your mind that, that says, okay, now we're, you're, we're using our imagination. We're, we're working with the filmmaker to believe in the story that they're telling us. Uh, instead, we look at something that looks very realistic, but at the same time, we have a little voice in our head that says, you know, that's not really real. Um, and so that's the big difference, I think, that movies exist now. We keep recycling the same old stories. And unlike the classic era of movies, when they would adapt movies from classic books or whatever, now we're adapting films from television series and cartoons. So the whole thing is becoming very uh, dumbed down and regressive. Well, I think a lot of that has to do with the people who have to fund the movie. They want to make money, so you get bankers working with filmmakers. I really think at the heart of the filmmakers, it's always been they want to make their movie. They want to make what's close to them. And then they get the script, and it goes to all these other people, and then it goes to all the bankers and everybody, and they have to jazz it up here or throw this out. No, that won't bring the big audience to see it, etc. So if, if someone is lucky enough to be their own boss, like we were, for instance, with the Mario Baba book, we could do whatever we wanted with it. Um, but if, if a filmmaker is lucky enough to do that, for instance, I'm thinking of Open Water, um, the horror, well, I, I think it's a suspense horror kind of film where these people are just out on their vacation and they, they go scuba diving and the boat leaves them. And then what happens then? These people shot this like on the weekends for a couple of years and they made a great movie. And I really wish more people could get back to that. Some people who, who financed their entire movies on a credit card to take a chance, you know? <laughs> Whatever, even the Blair Witch Project, they lucked out pretty quickly just doing their own sort of a thing, but it caught on real quick. But you don't need to have all the bells and whistles to have a good movie. And I really would love to see more of the writers and the filmmakers not having their stuff all messed with by all the big bankers. Yeah. Not movies that aren't made by committee, yeah. know, but made by individuals again. Yeah, love to see that. You have a policy of not taking unsolicited articles. Why is that? <laughs> oh, that's that's mostly because I'm a very lazy editor, and uh, if if I don't say that, we're going to get a lot of unsolicited manuscripts, and I'll have to sit down and, and read them. And when I when it, you know, in producing a monthly magazine, I really read about as much film criticism as I can, just selecting material for each issue. So if I have to read more than that to plan ahead, uh, then I've got to, you know, get get to know new writers on an introductory basis. And this this way, I, I can trust every single one of my writers to deliver something interesting. Um, and I know that they know what the magazine is about. We're a very difficult magazine to write for because um, we take such a technical approach to, uh, to our material. Uh, and I don't want to publish something that's very fanish or, or something like that. So it's, it's important really just to, um, 
you know, just just so that I can allot my, my available time where it's most useful. But I'll tell you, I mean, there have been people who've been very persistent who will drop an email with an idea for an article they have or have the, they've already got one and they'll attach it to their email. Um, and sometimes Tim finds something, you know, that he likes and he'll say, okay, fine. So it's the fact that we say no unsolicited manuscripts weeds out a lot of people who want to just be casual about it. But the diehard people who really think that it just belongs in the magazine, they'll get through. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like we just shut everybody out, but we just sort of have to put up this force field a little bit just so we can get our work done every month. Right. Uh, in, in fact, the feature article is, uh, it's in our, in our next issue is actually one of those one of those projects that uh, where, where someone just approached me and said, "I have this interview. Would you be interested?" And at that particular moment, I said yes, and I helped him shape the interview for for publication. Mm -hmm. Where do you find your writers? Uh, well, uh, I know a lot of people. You know, just just from having been active in, in the business myself for a while. So if, if there are people whose work I admire, you know, I will approach them and ask. Um, also, there are people who uh, started out as readers of our magazine mm -hmm. who, who actually endeared themselves to us through our letterbox page. Like John Charles, our associate editor. He, yeah. wrote, he wrote to us almost like, what, with issue two or something right, right after Pretty the first much issue? Right away. Much. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, at, at that stage, we were coming out less frequently, and I was yeah. doing a lot of the writing myself because we didn't have any money to pay writers. Mm -hmm. um, so I was doing a lot of it myself. But John just kept being very persistent, writing letters, and mm -hmm. so he was in practically every issue anyway. And also, I didn't know anybody else that had his level of expertise on Asian cinema, which I knew was very hot. And uh, I thought that he'd be a valuable asset to the mm -hmm. magazine. So I asked him to, uh, to join as a regular reviewer. And Ramsey Campbell, who writes for us now, a uh, monthly column, was an actual Video Watchdog subscriber and said that he'd like to write for us. So we said, sure. <laughs> sure. Well, yeah. Close, so happy to have it. Happy, yeah. So various means people fall into our grasp. <laughs> so we're happy to have them. Uh,